Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the MedTech Impact Podcast, where you get to hear from leaders and innovators who are shaping the future of medical technology. I'm Kyle Cruz. And I'm Richard Mikkeljohn. And we're your hosts of the show. Thanks, Kyle. So today we have with us Ron Murphy, CEO of The Romans. Welcome, Ron. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate it. And Kyle, pleasure to meet you. It's uh, it's great to great to be on and chat a little bit about our new technology. I'm very I'm really excited about this. It's be fun. Brilliant, Ron. Absolutely. Well, we can't wait to share your story. Um, as always, when we kick this conversation off, we like to frame that discussion. So please tell us what is the big problem that Theromics is looking to solve. Sure, I may have to go a little bit into thermal ablation 101, but um, thermal ablation is where you use actually use energy to um, to kill disease tissue in the body. Um, it's using a needle that looks something like this, hooked up to a generator, and they put it in the body, and they essentially cook the tissue and kill the uh, kill the lesion. In this case, tumors in liver, lung, and other places. Um, so what we're trying to do is mitigate what can be up to a 30% recurrence rate in some of these procedures. Now, thermal ablation is growing at 12% annually, but they do, it is constrained a little bit by this recurrence rate that we're trying to, uh, we're trying to eliminate. I, I guess the next follow-up question would be, you know, how often are these procedures being carried out? So it's funny, Richard, it's really difficult to quantify because there are so many different um, organ systems that ablation is being used in now used to be used in things like uh, liver cancer, and um, now it's being picked up in lung cancer, thyroid cancer, ablation, um, uterine fibroids, um, different, all sorts all over the body. So typical data is saying around 150,000 um, annual procedures uh, every year, um, but we're just seeing so many more people pick up ablation as a new frontline therapy that that's growing as I mentioned, 10 push percent plus annually. And Kyle, I know that you're um, well embedded with the ablation techniques given Global Connect's focus market. That's right. Well, yeah, no, Ron, I mean, as we were talking earlier, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of devices and technologies out there in the form of those scopes and probes and catheters like you just had up on the screen a moment ago. And I'm just curious, how are you kind of seeking to address, I guess, this problem with thermal ablation? I mean, what is that specific problem? Maybe talk more about that and how you plan to address the problem in thermal ablation. So what happens, Kyle, is in up to 30% of these cases, the ablation zone is more ellipsoid than it is round. And most tumors are round, believe it or not. So when you put one of these needles in a lesion, the kill zone is more egg-shaped than it is oval. So what happens is you actually miss disease at, let's use three o'clock and nine o'clock if you're using the transverse plane as an example. So when you miss that disease, you create an ablation zone that's ineffective. And there are also other things that when you uh, when you do an ablation like heat sinks, we use the term heat sink like a, a blood vessel in the liver. That what that what that heat sink does is actually takes heat away from the ablation, like your radiator does in your automobile. So if you're taking heat away from an, ad, an ablation, you're effectively lessening the effect the effectiveness of the ablation. So what we've done is we've created a simple biologic gel that moves heat much more effectively in tissue, making those ablation zones 50% larger and more spherical in half the time. Okay, and, and how's the gel used during the procedure? It's a simple injection. It's The gel itself is about the viscosity of commercial honey. So it's injected through a 19, 18 gauge needle right into the lesion or one and a half centimeters away, depending on what modality. We can use it with microwave ablation, uh, radio frequency ablation, IRE, all of these ablation technologies. Our, our gel is agnostic to what type, what type of energy is used. So you inject it right into, the, uh, right into the area, then you turn on the applicator and it moves the energy much better because the, the molecule in the, uh, in the gel is much larger, creating more frictional heat. 
Mm -hmm. and, and what are, I guess, the latest results that you're seeing from your testing uh, so far? Sure. Um, I mentioned this 50% larger in half the time. We actually have a published study that we did in a porcine model. Um, we published it in uh, radiology, um, which is one of the premier journals for um, for um, radiologists, uh, for lack of a better um, description, but interventional radiologists in particular. And those uh, we were able to show via MR thermometry that we were able to were actually able to make much larger and much more effective ablation zones. Okay, and so I guess Ron, something that I'm seeing uh, as again someone who works in the contract manufacturing industry with a lot of these ablation technologies. Yeah, we do see a lot of, I guess, RF ablation, right? But now what about pulse field ablation? I'm, I could be putting you a little bit on the spot here, but you know, I'm starting to learn more and more and you're seeing more and more pulse field ablation technologies come to market. And I think the real purpose of these technologies are to be more focused and protect the surrounding of tissues. What does that mean for your technology, sure. I guess? Sure. So one of the other um, great parts of our technology is has a blocking effect as well. So the gel goes in place, the energy hits on one side of the gel, but it doesn't absorb all the way through the gel. So if you have a critical structure on the other side, we'll use the neurovascular bundle in, in the prostate, for example, or the pleura and lung. So you can actually protect those critical structures on the other side. Now, pulse field, we realize, is very, very cool and very innovative. Um, we're seeing a lot of application in cardiac uh, in cardiac ablations. Um, a little bit further along with Galvanize and other technologies, we're going to be seeing that in other in other um, disease states. But we sure. think that Shout we can be- Shout out to the ALEA can... technology right there, right? Right. right. Yeah. So we can we can be uh, we can be complementary to pulse field technology as well. We can work our gel can work with a simple injection with uh, with pulse field. Perfect. At the end of the day, it's really neat though to hear how you're bringing this gel to market that's simply allowing these devices to be far more effective and have greater outcomes in these procedures. So uh, thanks for sharing those insights there. Yeah. At a less at less of a cost too as well. There you go. In, okay. Importantly, yeah, yeah and yeah, right. Carl, to your point, this is like the perfect type of technology. You know, improving on other existing approaches and procedures. But something, Ron, you touched on there was potentially there's a lot of applications for how you take this to market. So, like, where are you starting to focus on, and how did you come about deciding on that particular area? Sure. So, most of our work, and particularly with our clinician who is a key opinion leader in the ablation space, Dr. Damien Dupuy, down at um, Cape Cod Hospital, believe it or not, um, is um, in uh, again in liver ablation work, and we've seen this particular like, heat sink effect a lot in liver because it's a highly vascularized organ. Now, the ability for us to mitigate recurrence in liver is a tremendous, uh, it's a tremendous benefit to the healthcare system. However, these other potentials that we're seeing, and one that we've been really frequent, we've been focusing on um, lately is uterine fibroid ablation. Uterine fibroids are not a lesion, it's not a tumor, although some of them do turn into tumors, but they are larger and bulkier. And if you can debulk that, that uterine fibroid with a gel, but they're, they're difficult to ablate because of the size of them. So we think maybe with a simple injection of our gel, we can get a much larger ablation and debulk uterine fibroids. And it's potentially a huge market because um, I think 70% of women by the time they reach a certain age, actually have um, uterine fibroids. Not all of them are symptomatic, obviously, but uh, so we think there's a potentially huge market for it there as well. But we also have drug delivery, which we haven't talked about um, in combination with ablation, which is really the um, our what we think is is our future is going to be staked on. Well, we know well about fibroids from our discussion with Shrieker from Nisa MedTech. Um, recommend big shout out to that podcast episode if you want to dig into that topic more, but. It sounds like, again, you've got this really cool approach for multiple applications. Uh, you've obviously got a KOL on the side, but are you having discussions with other big partners? Because again, this seems like, you know, this is going to be something that could be utilized by a lot of big players in the market. Yeah, and Richard, that's, and I, it's a great point. And it's sort of our, my, <laughs> how, how I'm tasked to bring this thing forward, because mm -hmm. not only do we have the ablation part of the business, which is, 
ablation in multiple organs, but we have this drug delivery. So what we can do is we can impregnate drugs in our gel and then follow up with an ablation. Now we have created an entirely new therapy that we call TACT, thermally activated combination therapy. So we have this ablation technology that fits well with the ablation manufacturers. Take, for example, Medtronic, Boston Scientific, and Geodynamics, Varian. They're all in this, play, in this space. We are actually complementary to all of their probes and equipment. But we also have this ability to mix our gel with any small molecule drug that will withstand a temperature of a 150 degrees C. So there are billion dollar drugs out there that we can actually put in our gel. We can ablate the tumor and then the ablated gel actually acts like a conduit to elute the drug right there in the place of the lesion and mitigate all most of the systemic side effects of delivery of chemotherapy, which we know makes our hair fall out and makes our hearts blow up and all other bad things. Well, so it we sounds like having... something they should, they should be biting off your hands, take away, because it's, you know, it's an answer <laughs> to everyone's problems. Well, we're, you know, and that, again, that's, the, that's one of the, as a, as a company, we have to focus on one thing. So what we're doing is hoping to partner with our drug delivery business with Big Pharma. And we are actually working on an industry sponsored study and work with alongside um, the ablation manufacturers to potentially kit pack our product with their um, gels and probes or sell it outright uh, via a uh, hybrid sales for. You know, that's interesting because you're talking here about two potentially different go-to-market strategies, yeah, right? Exactly. Um, and it sounds like first and foremost, here you are focused on kind of bringing your heat sink gel to market just at the moment, right? For the immediate focus is the thermal, uh, just to kind of help improve the thermal ablation side, right? Where drug exactly. delivery is kind of a little bit further out. You've got to call and And the reason for that is the regulatory pathway. We're a 510K regu we're a 510K device to get to the soft tissue of the coagulation and um, and ablation of soft tissue. So our 510K de novo device, when we add a, a, a drug to it, then the um, there'll be a different regulatory pathway to that. So we want to get to the market quickly by as soon mm -hmm. as 2025 with our ablation accelerant, which we call our ablation accelerant technology. And then we will be in the, it will concurrently in a similar, in a, in a concurrent path, we'll be developing the drug delivery technology. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. What's the initial feedback been from specialists out of Cape Cod Hospital? What are they saying and what kind of feedback are you getting from, from them so far? So one of the things that we did initially before I took on this project is we went out to the Society for Interventional Oncology meeting conference and we did a proof of, uh, we did a, a customer study. We did a survey and we chatted with uh, interventional radiologists and we said, number one, if you could mitigate your occurrence rate by 10 or 15%, would you use a gel? 95% of them said, yeah. If you could, um, if you could, if it were a simple injection, would you add a simple injection into your procedure? 100% said yes. When you get down to, when you started to drill down though, into how many would really use it versus cost, that's where we got the, we got the, uh, we got the real nice details where what would be uh, an effective cost uh, selling point for our gel and how, how these interventional radiologists would use it. So our initial way was to go to the market first and fast to find out whether we have a need. I mean, right. there are a lot of Me Too products out there that are better mousetraps, but is there, a, is there a clinical need and what are the cost savings um, in your, that you're bringing to the system as well? Yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, I would imagine too, you know, a lot of, you know, investors and just companies and businesses in general, get to market, prove that there's a need, prove the effectiveness of the device, capture some revenue and reinvest it back into the organization and your technology to then allow you guys to, you know, start working on the drug delivery yeah. side. It makes a lot of sense. Exactly. Mm hmm well, it sounds like you're primed for this, like one of these hockey sticks sitting behind Kyle for the hockey stick growth. But I, I'm sure there's still <laughs> nice a few challenges. The God's ear. <laughs> yeah. But of course, I'm sure there are a few challenges still ahead of you. So, you know, what are those big challenges lying in front at the moment? Well, one of the things that um, we, we met with the FDA in 2019, we now have a very clear regulatory pathway, but let's not, let's, 
say it wasn't without its challenges. Um, and one of the challenges in our regulatory pathway is they didn't know where to put us. Um, because we were a device, we said that, um, well, because we're an implant and that implant stays in the body for a certain period of time, we were able to talk to the, to the regulatory authorities and say that we were a device. Now, there is a biologic component to our, um, our gel. It's a uh, biopolymer that may, that's made from parts of the human body. So what happens is the medical device portion had to speak with the biologics portion of the, uh, of the FDA. So there's a lot of crosstalk. And, and again, because nobody's ever done the thermal accelerant before, it was initially pretty difficult to get them onboarded as to what we were trying to do. Um, we have that full buy-in now. We've got a full plan. Uh, we're doing, we just started a chronic animal study um, last week. Um, to gather data for our FDA submission, which we hope to have by uh, by um, the middle of 2024. But um, that was one of the challenges. And one of the other challenges that we, and every entrepreneur should be um, concerned about is their IP estate and making sure that they keep, keep up to date with their IP estate, keep adding continuations in process um, and who, we, who, they, it's, who they chat with and sharing their data. Yeah, that's so true, Ron. I think that idea of maintaining your IP, and we always talk about the freedom to operate, you know, and being aware of what else is out there. It's just that constant thing that is on that never-ending list of things to do. It is. It is. You have to be very careful. Uh, published IP is, is your best friend. And obviously, as you go through this process, you're going to be bringing in some needed investment. You know, how are you finding that right now? I know that's a problem, of course, for the majority of the startups we speak to, but What's been the latest in terms of Theromics fundraising? Yeah, um, it, 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 what we've been trying to do maybe a little bit different. Um, we don't fall into the sweet spot for typical inst institutional capital, which is uh, or venture capital, because what we're trying to do is raise smaller chunks of capital uh, with the addition of non-dilutive financing. We just um, received a five a, a million dollar grant from the National Science Foundation, a phase two FTTR grant. Um, we're dovetailing that in with a, a small convertible note that we're offering to, to angel investors and small institutions. But we, what you're trying to do is we're trying to get to the next inflection point and see our pathway forward with strategic partners and collaborators versus funding the entire project all the way out to commercialization. Um, Milestone-based funding um, through smaller bites at the apple, I think, is the way that uh, is the way that we're approaching it, and um, hopefully, it's going to be the right approach. Ron, I, I really appreciate that strategy, and I I'm so glad you just shared that information because you know I, I think we see so many companies, you know, Richard, I mean. All, as well, we see so many early stage companies come to market, and when they are successful at at you know, capturing capital and landing the investments needed to take their product from development, you know, to the market. A lot of the times, you know, you're seeing some of this funding and you're like, my goodness gracious, you know, I mean, it is so out of control. I mean, you see companies with a hundred million dollars in funding and I'm over here scratching my head going, uh, at what point are you going to ever be profitable? And, you know, for a strategic to come along and kind of make that acquisition at that point, if they're at all interested, I mean, yeah. you're talking. How do you exit? I, exactly. Hmm. So yeah. I, I think that's brilliant. I, I mean, I just, I love that strategy. And you were alluding to some, some milestones um, that you've already, that are kind of in the works right now. But I guess, um, you know, other than maybe, landing some funding and getting some, uh, I think you were, were mentioning studies that were being done right sure. now. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. What are, what are those key milestones then look like, you know, over the next six to 18 months, especially relating to the million dollar grant you just received? Yeah, so Kyle, I mean, it's, it's really funny that, that you just articulated the conversation that I had this morning at 10 o'clock in the middle of the seaport district. And I'm pointing up at these, these beautiful billions and I'm saying, this is where your fifty million dollar investments are going. They're going to hmm. um, to uh, to rent in these beautiful buildings. We're a lot more about capital efficiencies. Um, we want to do things inexpensively. We run out of a private incubator. We do things um, as cheaply as as possible because not only is this a business to bring patients good care, but it is a business also. Um, investors return for a reason. They are altru altruistic but they are also investing in your company for a reason. They want to return. So 
What we're looking for is milestones as we're doing right now, we're doing an animal study to get to our FDA submission by the middle of 2024. They actually have a thermal accelerant on the market by 2025, early 2025. Additionally, we have a uh, an animal study that we're we're doing. I may have mentioned with a large pharma company um, here in Boston. We're studying one of their proprietary drugs that is going to be. We're using our gel to deliver that drug directly into a lesion and then ablate that lesion. And our gel will act as a delivery drone to deliver over a control period of time this um, this drug. Um, much more effective delivery. Use much less 90, you use 5% of the drug that you normally will, and you mitigate all the side effects. The data from all of those are going to get us a long way in collaborating in strategic partnerships and funding this either to the next level or to potential MA um, transaction. Because the way that we look at our company is there's a lot of moving parts. And for us to develop all the moving parts, it is going to take some capital. So the best way to get that capital, I think, is more to collaborate and partner. Great. It sounds uh, like you've got this is, some exciting partnerships on the horizon. Yeah, Richard, go ahead. I was just going to say, this is brilliant, Ron. I mean, you're covering so many fantastic pieces of advice here. I'm thinking this is not your first rodeo. There's clearly a very experienced team here. You know, you mentioned the KOLs involved in the team. You know, who else is involved with Theromics at this stage? Sure. So the technology was actually developed by... Um, Dr. Damien Dupuy, who was one of the first, uh, one of the pioneers in ablation. He did the first lung ablations at Mass General um, back in the 80s or 90s, I forget. And uh, Dr. William Park, who was the head of molecular imaging at uh, at uh, Brown University. And Dr. Dupuy just had this, this vision of, listen, I have a 30% recurrence rate in some of these lesions. If I can bring this down to standard of care, then we don't have to do surgery. We don't have to cut half of, a, half of a person's liver out. We don't have to have people take poison. We don't have to have chemo. We don't have to irradiate them. We can do a simple Band-Aid procedure, stick a needle in and, um, and burn out the tumor as long as we make sure that we get that entire lesion. So we took the technology out of Brown University back in 2017. We spun it out and we wrapped a company around it. And um, from there, it's been... Uh, Ourselves, we use a lot of the Mass Life Sciences Initiative. Um, interns out of Mass Life Sciences, as I say, we do things capital efficiently. So it's a very, very small team. With our grant, we will be hiring a couple of postdocs and researchers to move the technology along, particularly when it comes to the drug delivery part of this. And so it seems like this is some pretty high-grade technology you're developing. How have you find finding the right technology experts, you know, is there people in the field who can come in and step into this? Because I know you mentioned using the Mass Life Science Center internship voucher system, you know, are you, are you finding the right quality of people to nudge the needle and help you go forward? Well, I, I will tell you, um, we are, the last intern that we got out of Northeastern University out of their Gordon mentorship program was a, was an absolute rock star. Um, she was, we were able to uh, leave her to do whatever we tasked her with. And if she did not know it she had figured it out so we have been very fortunate in getting interns that are qualified and mass life sciences pays for it um so this again runs to the capital efficiencies part of the model um getting things done is least expensive but with the best assets that are available so uh, okay, we've been very fortunate I just want to finish that by saying that, uh, yeah, I'm obviously a little bit biased with my UMass Lull uh, hat on here that I think we have some amazing students coming through the biomedical engineering and just through the school in general. So it's a it's an amazingly rich, untapped resource, which more people should be making use of. And so it's great to hear that you're able to do that. Yep. Invaluable for us, um, for us startups. Absolutely. Yeah, no question. And And so... You know, Ron, I guess reflecting back over kind of your experiences to date here uh, with Romics, you know, if you had to pick your top kind of one to three tips, what are some of the learnings or advice uh, that you would like to share with the audience? Um, don't be afraid to ask. Don't be mm -hmm. afraid to ask anyone anything. Um, but again, I go back to this meeting this morning and I just... As we were chatting about how to approach a value analysis committee in a hospital, I was like, okay, how do we come up with an internal rate of return or a return on capital or an uh, or a um, uh, 
or that calculus for a pitch to a hospital value committee. So I put my hand up and I asked. And after that, after that, a couple of people came up to me and they said, listen, we do this for a living. And I said, I said well, that's great. Let's let's chat. So you're always learning. You're always networking as well. Always making sure that your contacts are 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 advocates of your technology and don't discount any of the stuff that should be that you think you shouldn't be doing at this point because when it comes time when a crunch time comes you're going to need to be a jack of all trades and you're going to need to know a little bit about of everything as you move it forward great points ron and and i um i'm just you know what motivates you you know to be involved <laughs> every day with the, these projects, these efforts. I mean, you just sound like someone who's always putting yourself out there. You're always networking to your point and, and looking to get feedback from others. I mean, it's so much, uh, you know, we, in Richard, we always talk to all these early stage companies and we hear how much goes into it, you know? So, you know, you clearly have to be seriously motivated. So, I mean, what's motivating you every day? Yeah, you got you you've got to be all in, <laughs> particularly all in on six hours sleep a night. But um, you know, I sold my soul my soul to Wall Street to investment banking for twenty plus years. I was a. It's funny. I I, I went. My undergrad was. Uh, I I wanted to be a doctor. Undergrad. I didn't. Unfortunately, I was. I drank too much beer in college rather than uh, <laughs> rather than study to be a doctor. So um, so I sold my soul to Wall Street. Um, at that point, I wanted to do something else, and I had always had a lot of interest in the medical field. And a friend of mine that owned a ma contract manufacturer said, "Listen, we're starting up new companies. You know, kind of your finance skill set might be helpful." And at that point, I was all in. So I was deep down into pig guts, doing animal procedures, and learning how to operate fluoro and echo and doing all of that stuff as we started to develop new technologies. And it's just, it, it, it just, it's a passion that you get after you're, uh, after you've been there for a while. Oh, that's great. That's really exciting. Well, Kyle, it sounds like Ron's the sort of guy who gets the sleeves rolled up, which is what we love about all the best founders and, you know, making things happen. Um, looking ahead, Ron, you know, what's that big vision? You know, where would you like to see Theromics in five years time? Is there an exit, you know, on the horizon or what's that future big milestone further down the field yeah um richard one of the things that that we wrestle with is or that i wrestle with is is this technology because of the multiple platforms and because of the multiple uses of the technology is it better in the hands of a larger person or a larger strategic collaborator or are the sum of, or the sum of the parts worth more than the whole because we have this drug delivery part of the business that looks towards pharma or that's pointed towards former pharma and then we have this ablation accelerant part of the business that's more pointed um towards medical device and they're divergent paths we understand that so there's the potential for licensing the drug delivery to either one or multiple dr drug delivery partners or drug companies there's a potential to um enhance the uh the ablation platform with a uh, collaboration or an m a transaction with a medical device partner. And those medical device partners, again, are, are all of the big players because most of them have platforms um, that do ablation. So we are looking at everything. Um, there may be the potential to monetize part of the company, just part of the company very quickly and uh, develop the other part of the company. So we are looking at everything. We have discussions with everybody. We're always... Uh, always open to further collaborative discussions. Well, that's yeah, great. That's You're always open to further discussions. Please tell the yeah. people how they can get a hold of you then. Sure. So um, I always answer my phone, 508-942-8477. Um, Bold Ron... move right there, Ron. <laughs> We've got know, a huge right? audience out there. So <laughs> that phone's going to start ringing yeah, off. Yeah, the I know. I, this I, story. That's okay. We'll go ahead and we'll cut that out. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, um, but um, Ron at theromicsinc.com or um, theromicsron at gmail.com. Either one is fine. 
Um, always available to take phone calls. Love to chat about our, our platform. Um, it's, uh, it's very different, very interesting, new novel. Nobody's ever done a thermal accelerant before, so we're really excited about our, our, our potential. Awesome. We can see why. This has been brilliant, Ron. Great product, and thank you so much for the discussion today. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Kyle. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, Ron, that was awesome, man. And we are going to keep your phone number in there, so I hope it does ring <laughs> off the hook. Uh, but yeah, real pleasure. Uh -oh. We really do appreciate you coming on today and sharing your technology and uh, and just insights, you know, into the future of these these thermal ablation technologies. And it just sounds like a really exciting future ahead um, for everyone involved, especially you know us patients out there, to knowing that this type of care is you know has the potential to see a whole new level of innovation. Um, it's pretty special, and it's really special that. Everyone heard it here first on the MedTech podcast. So uh, that was great. Ron, thanks again. Appreciate it. Great having you on the show. Until next time, I'm Kyle Cruz. And I'm Richard Mikuljan. Keep innovating.